Here we are, Women Matters. And today, oh, I don't know, I think something like 14th September, and we continue with the feminine shadow. I'm Heidi in Italy, the wisdomfactory.net, but today I give over to Gertraud to lead us through the session and we cooperate in some way. Okay, give over to you. Yeah, hi. Hi, we have a new edition. <laughs> hi, oh. hi, Lou. It's great. So uh, we'll do a check-in round, a first round. And I have a question and um, a request that you say where you call in from. So where you located your name and not an extended. <laughs> um, Okay, so in this first round, uh, let's see, do we have good news from since last time um, or an interesting challenge to share and your name and location? Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm Gertrude from Germany. <laughs> So why don't you start and then give over to the others? Yeah, I have some good news, women, uh, in, in this field. I, I had a guest for this whole week from the integral. I saw her first time in Hungary, and then I met her again in another seminar. And then we started to chat and have daily conversations. And now she just came from Norway and now is on her way to Vienna. It's really, I mean, somebody you just don't know to come to know. This is really nice. Complete. Who wants to go next? All right, I go next. I am Monia. I live in Vienna. It's rather hot again. Late summer, Indian summer, beautiful weather. And well, the good news is that I have found two books I'm reading simultaneously. Uh, one is called High Weirdness. And one is called, uh, it's by Robert Wilson. Uh, and the other book is about Robert Wilson. So about, it's called Cosmic Trigger. And uh, to read the background scenery of how these people in the 70s got to their ideas is quite fascinating to me. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling fine. I hope you too, all of you. And I give on to the newcomer, Lucy, because I'm rather curious where she comes from and where she is. I am Lucy. I am from Brazil, but I live here in Spain, Madrid. And I, uh, this uh, week I am doing a new music and it's for to a competition about to making a music for to a poetry of a Galician Gal 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 poetry, poet. And so I am doing the music and having fun because I always have a lot of fun doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> and the next one, Vittoria. Hi, Vittoria. How are you? <laughs> and you're well, Lucy? I, I still have the coronavirus uh, by the, the test. I have done it, it's, it's still not uh, negative yet, but I don't have any symptoms. I'm fine. Oh, great. It's fine. Oh, great. I'm Victoria and I'm um, calling from La Mesa, California. And this is my daughter, Beatrice. Um, her name works in every language, so you can call her whatever you want. <laughs> Beatrice or Beatrice or Beatrice. Um, in Vienna, they always called her Beatrice, I guess, because uh, Italy is so close by. Um, and 
Well, she's my good news. <laughs> she flew in f uh, from New York on Wednesday. Um, Thursday was my birthday, so she was kind of a birthday present. And we also, um, we did a, a, a vigil yesterday, which went very well. And it was wonderful to have the opportunity to work together collaboratively and creatively. Um, and it gives us hope for future work together. And Heidi was there, so um, it was wonderful to see you, Heidi, and thank you for coming. Wait, I get to go. Oh, you get to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, she has a voice. <laughs> I'm Beatrice, and, I'm also... and congratulations, belated. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, my mother already mentioned the vigil, which was really beautiful, and, and we, um, it was a challenge to put together, but I think it came out really well. So we're very, I'm very proud of what we, what we put together yesterday. It was, um, musicians and poets and dancers from all over the world contributed and we organized the program and it was really beautiful and touching. Um, I guess, but my, my, my upcoming challenge slash good news is I, on Friday, um, unless something changes, um, I'm supposed to defend my master's thesis. Um, yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm excited. I'm a little, little nervous. Um, one of my panelists just told me that she might not be able to do it. So I need, might need to replace her. So I don't know, but, um, but all that to say pretty soon, I will have my master's degree and I will be finished and that's exciting. So <laughs> can you tell us the, the, subject or your major or whatever you call it yeah so i i went to nyu gallatin where you build your own degree um and i studied a uh, contemporary uh american views of uh, death and grief and mourning mm. and why we are so resistant to uh engaging with those topics and engaging with each other when we experience those things in life and I built a, an artistic installation with video art and sound um, and kind of environmental design uh, for grief processing, which unfortunately was only open for one day because it got closed down uh, because of the COVID, COVID closures. So, but, um, but it was a big undertaking and, um, and I got to document it, which is good. So I hope to do it again sometime. Thank you. Um, I'll go. I'm Christine and I'm in Carlsbad, California, which is not that far from Victoria and Beatrice. Um, it's been mostly a stressful week. Uh, yeah, pretty stressful. But the good news uh, uh, is like Monia, I have a, a good book to read. It's called The Women, The Woman's Hour. And it, it's about um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment in the United States Amendment to the Constitution to give women the right of vote, to vote. And I also saw a, a TV special on it and um, just was really blown away by the struggle that took 72 years in the United States for women start to end to get the right to vote and all the people uh, that contributed and sacrificed and um, three generations of women had to keep uh, struggling. So it, it's a, a pretty unique uh, story. It was good. So I'm reading that book and uh, enjoying that. That's, that's the good stuff uh, right now. And everybody I know is still healthy. So that's also uh, good news. And Heidi, do you wanna go? Yeah, uh, I said before who I am and where I am, as you know, in Italy, and I really love the weather. It's still warm, but not hot. Not really hot. I mean, Germans would say it's hot, but for me, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, and the good news, for instance, yesterday, it was, I got to know some of your friends, Victoria and Beatrice. It was, uh, it was the topic of death and grief and... Um, I think it's very important to talk about it. Also, you know, last time in our women's group, the German women's group, we also were talking about that because there is a new woman whose uh, partner died from one moment to the other 
only a few weeks ago and that is really a disruptive thing when it happens you know so i think we have to talk it talk about it in the collective also maybe that leads also in the topic of today in the, the shadow that's maybe not a feminine shadow necessarily a collective one but a collective shadow it is that we are pushing away um, this topic uh, yeah all together i'm okay so i would love to invite martini despite i cannot see you but the others said they can see you so i hope yes we can good so how is it for you um i'm fine as well uh, i enjoyed last um, time we talked together and i was inspired by christine her um, mail that she sent about richard Roar. And he um, uh, sent out a daily meditation. And I uh, did have a look in it. And I, uh, they also use uh, paintings. And I, uh, it helped me very much because a lot of the themes about death and sickness and things like that, I painted in in because it was the story of my own life so i am very pleased that um in the way that he um goes into the depth paintings very much because a lot of sickness and things like that it was the story of my own life so it took two years ago so it, it is and i i can uh, do quite a bit with it today and uh, uh, i have still difficulties with the techniques i uh, sometimes the voice is going away and i truly am uh, stick in a position or you are stick in a position but this is not a theme i try to follow you and uh, i'm pleased to be here thank you yeah thank you martini can you say where you are from I am from um, Austria, um, Kritzendorf, that is close to Vienna. And it is in uh, um, uh, close to the Danube, Blue Danube. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I, I'm living in the woods, mm. in the silence. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So a quick round. What's your current mood? What's your desired mood? Just to set up the space. You're muted, Victoria. Um, my current mood is um, delight. Really? <laughs> and it's wonderful to be with all you ladies and my desired mood is more delight <laughs> <laughs> my my current mood is well i don't know if it counts as a mood but tired i just woke up we just woke up okay. <laughs> and my desired mood is um, i think contentment and peace hmm thank you So I continue. My mood is equanimity. And I don't know if I desire to leave it. It's just very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see if my mood changes. Or, but right now, I'm just yeah, fine as I am. Okay, I pass on to Christine. Um, my current mood is a little sad or a little wistful, not exactly sad, but um, a little uh, longing and my desired mood would be um, more one of contentment 
acceptance. Just think Heidi. if we, yeah, if you gave me the right word, uh, what I was looking for. My current mood is also longing for something which I don't really exactly know what it is. And my desired mood would be either to know what it is and go for it or <laughs> become just, you know, inspired as I normally are after our conversation. So mm. good mood, good do you say? I'm in good mood that I will have the good mood. So <laughs> <laughs> we lost Lucy. So, uh, Martini, would you go on? Yes. Um, my mood is um, happy. I'm happy uh, because I see beautiful faces in front of me. And um, I think, uh, yeah, it is always probably a challenge to, um, I love the people. That's what I, I can't say anything else. I, I think it is a privilege. Thank you. Um... And while I'm saying my mood, you can see the, I, I posted the, our agreement. So you just pick one out that stands out for you and what you want to emphasize today. My current mood is a little bit sleepy. I mean, so <laughs> ready for a nap. Um, and content and somehow a little bit slow. My desired mood is um, happy, cheerful, even though we talk about shadows. And yeah, that's, that's about it. So, not everybody has to, but if there is a longing for a specific agreement to emphasize on, you just pick it. And I think that will be the one that is resonating most in the field. Uh, I'm still wondering if, apart from the shadow, we could hear a little more about the caravan of unity, because you mentioned it and it sounds, yeah, sounds beautiful. So I just wanted to know if, yeah, are you continuing this or uh, this is what my longing would be. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So for me, sinking in present moment awareness, that's, that's the most powerful emerging. And yeah, so we had this big uh, women's shadow, but uh, maybe something else or in this field, what's coming up for you. So, and Monia, you already shared. Muted, Beatrice. Oh, we're we're talking to each other a little bit <laughs> behind behind the muted screen. No, I I was going to say even before you said it, the the feeling free to sink in present moment awareness was also jumping out at me yeah. um, from that list. So I second that. Um, well, I I don't know what's wrong with me today, um, <laughs> but. Um, usually I'm not like this. Um, what jumped at me was the aiming for 100% play and maximum 69 serious, but, um, but I'm not sure if I can get up to 69% with the serious, so. I, <laughs> <You> don't <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm so 
a boolean today um, but anyway i'll try to get back into the shadow <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's just um yeah just open the the space and whatever emerges is right <laughs> and so who wants to to start the conversation and whatever yeah, I wanted to start in reply to Victoria. Maybe you are talking about the golden shade, shadow, you know, <laughs> which finally you can be playful. Or maybe I didn't understand it right, but I understood that you want just to, to play today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a golden shadow, no? To accept our genius, our good sides, our outstanding sides. Well, I have a question for the group that I've been pondering, and that is how much of feminine collective shadow was uh, instituted or chosen by women ourselves versus imposed upon us, because it seems that through most of history, um, women have been property and told, you know, what to do by men, what, what we could or couldn't do. Um, and it's only been in really modern history where women have had a lot of freedom. And I'm sure throughout history, women obviously have made their mark. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from women who have been spectacular and and obviously made history and done incredible things and, and used their voice. But as a collective, <laughs> um, yeah, women have not been free to necessarily even explore or decide for themselves what they can and cannot do. So uh, my question being, is our shadow self-imposed or other imposed, or is that even a stupid question? I, I feel kind of like it's more other imposed, but um, I'm open to hear arguments to the other side. Can, before we answer that question, can, since I was not here last time, can someone briefly explain how, how are we defining the shadow or what, it, what is in the shadow or how are we thinking about that concept? The shadow, by definition, is that what we don't see. And so we are not aware of it. You know, and it can be a positive shadow, as I said before, and it can be a negative shadow, which is hindering us in, in our lives. And in response to Christine, I, I think that collectively, maybe it has been imposed to a certain extent by men, the shadow, but we women have collaborated to maintain it for hundreds of years, you know, by, uh, by imposing it on our daughters and by reinforcing it. Uh, I'm just thinking it came popped up to me, the genital mut mutilations in, in Africa. That's done by women. It's not done by men. So um, at least we are a good helper in maintaining the feminine shadow. Uh, so if it originally came by man or uh, imposed by man that we are have to keep so many things in the shadow or not that we choose it for some reason or other that's the question i don't know i think for instance um uh, the women who often have um parano paranormal uh, uh, cap capacities like me media cap capacities, they from their mothers were oppressed these capacities because in the histo history, uh, Christian history, they would have been burned on the stake. And so uh, the women took care that their daughters couldn't develop these and accept and live these capacities. And I imagine that can be with other things too and that was not the fathers that were the mothers who who kept them down so 
I don't know. Well, That's my idea. I object, Heidi. I, I, object. I object too because okay. I, <laughs> I objected I first. That... <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's just a short um, because there are always grandmothers, and it's usually the right the line from the grandmother to the grandchild that keeps a talent going. That's what my impression is. And yeah, that's what I wanted to interview. And Christine, what did, did you What's object? the objection, Monia? I didn't get that. But the objection is that uh, Heidi said the mothers are press for the safety of the child, their talent. But usually there is also a grandmother. And the line goes from the grandmother to the grandchild. And so it's kept going. Maybe not that uh, openly, but it's kept going. That's my, uh, my own story. So this is what the, my own experience is. Um, and I'm objecting not that I, I think he, what Heidi said isn't true, because I think it is true that mothers have perpetuated it. But I think the part where she said, you know, for the safety of the daughters, I mean, it is men who decided what the punishment would be of burning at the stake. Women didn't come up with that. Um, and the genital mutilation, I mean, what happens if you don't toe the line? I think mothers have mostly tried to protect daughters from some worse fate um, as opposed to, well, I'm, I'm sure again that they've bought into it to some extent because they themselves lived it, so they've bought into it. But I think the punishments weren't decided by women. Um, I, I'm sort of turning the corner on that and reflecting on something that has bothered me since I was a child, which was that I um, always, from, from my earliest childhood, didn't think at all about appearance. And I just was living, living my life, basically. And so I was somewhat ostracized. Um, all my friends from earliest childhood on were, were boys. And I think that was part of the reason. I was not interested in clothing. I was not interested in, well, any of the things that the girls in my, um, you know, my age were interested in. And then it became very extreme later because, um, because the, you know, as, as we got older, it was all about, you know, sexuality and looking attractive and low cleavage and short skirts and um, showing your legs. Um, and the conversations were, were geared towards um, how attractive one girl was over another or whatever. And I always saw a strange um, disconnect between that, that attitude and at the same time, this desire to be uh, considered equal. And as I became an adult, it became even more pronounced. And even you know, as a, as a performing artist, um, I was constantly hammered on by women I knew who said, why don't you, you know, look more sexy on stage? Why don't you look more attractive? Why don't you, um, you know, show off your good figure? I mean, not anymore, believe me, but it, it was then. <laughs> And I, it made me really enraged because, and this is where I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Heidi, 100%. I think that, um, and I think that women are still silent on that subject. I think still you have these news anchors on television and you have the movie stars and you have you know, all the celebrities, the whole cult, where there's still an emphasis on physical beauty, on a certain type of figure, on a certain type of personality. Um, flirtation, a kind of coquettishness. If there's a woman anchor with a man anchor, um, there's a strange dynamic. And um, you just don't see that when it's two men together, or for that matter, two women together. So, so for me, there's a, there's a hypocrisy that is still very apparent in culture. And, um, and I'm still feeling very much like an outsider in that sense that, that um, still, my, my professional colleagues tend to be men more because we're focusing, um, it's just a different kind of mentality, I guess. I don't know. It's, um, and I'm longing to bring the two together because as I grow older, I feel much more connected to women than to men because, um, 
because I see what the issues are and what the conflicts have been and what the history has been. And having a daughter myself, I, I do feel a sense of, you know, wanting the world to be more advanced so that she can play the role she's meant to play regardless of gender, regardless of society's norms. So, so that's something I'd love to talk about is um, this, this kind of um, disconnect between the values where one thing is said and another thing is done. And why is that? This complicitness that you were talking about, Heidi, I think is where I relate what you told us. Can you pick one value, Victoria, that you're thinking of that where we say one thing and do another? Are, are you speaking again of, of appearance or was there a different value you wanted to explore? Um, well, it's, a, it's appearance on the, um, yeah, it's hard to articulate. It, maybe you can help me find it better because I see, I see the appearance aspect as the tip of the iceberg. So it goes much deeper than that. It's something about how women have been perceived, but also how they have, um, how they have manifested their femininity over the centuries and millennia. You know, how, well, like Heidi said, I don't know. I think, I think what it is, is to make it broader is, is why, why is it that women are complicit apart from when they are, you know, manipulated or it's for survival or, I mean, not going to the extremes, the, the subtle, the subtle manifestations of that. Um, the, the dynamic, why, why is it that there'll be, like in Japan, for example, when we look in Japan, that was really interesting to me because, um, and my Japanese women friends told me that what I was perceiving was, was a reality in the culture that the women, when their men are around, they, they play this geisha role and they do it very beautifully. They're totally submissive, they're beautiful, they're quiet. The man can take advantage of them. He can even beat them if, if he feels so inclined. It's horrifying. And yet, and yet in the background, what nobody sees, the woman handles all the finances, all the accounts. The entire household is managed by her completely. The man has absolutely no say. And, um, and she is in charge of the raising of the children in every respect, including education and career. So what is that about? That, I mean, that would fascinate me, but of course, none of us are Japanese, so I don't know the intricacies, but, um, but that's, a, that's a really overt demonstration to me of this strange dynamic that's in place. And, and to me, it's just full of shadows because there's, there's no honesty there. There's no directness. It's, there's all this shifting behind the curtain. Uh, would you call it role play? I don't want to be the only person talking. <laughs> Is that a general question? No, it's a question to you, the Japanese yeah. women, that they are role playing. Yeah, no, no. And I it keeps the man just satisfied and they do whatever they want yeah. to do and the rest. So that's. No, I think I it wouldn't call it a shadow. I think that's. Uh, yeah, it's manipulation, some kind of manipulation. Well, to me, yeah, I'm very fixated on authenticity. That's my problem. Mm -hmm. For me, the highest value in life is, mm -hmm. is integrity and authenticity. So for me, it's, that's what makes it shadowy. It's, it's the sense that you never, but, but yeah, and both parties are complicit in, in the role playing. So, mm -hmm. um, and maybe also because I'm a performer, I mean, I don't mean that as a joke, but I think um, I know in my innermost being that as a performer, you know, I can be totally depressed and miserable and I can be sick. I can even have a fever. But if I have to perform, I override all of that in a second. And I, I, I'm at my very best, regardless of what's going on inside. So, sometimes even better. Sometimes even better. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I know, I know intimately about role playing and, and what can be powerful and good about it, but also, um, yeah, but for me, it has to, this authenticity in, in one's daily life and one's real life and one's relationships um, is, so, is so crucial. And I think, um, I think that's the thing that, that is difficult. 
And maybe, you know, Christine, you started by talking about the, um, you know, women's suffrage. And I think that's that in itself, if we looked at the women, the women who were fighting, fighting for the cause over those three generations and how, because the, the little I know, and it's very little, but I'd love to hear someone else talk about it. This, this role playing that, that Monia says, in fact, I think it's very um, pertinent there because I think all of those women had to play multiple roles simultaneously, depending on where they were and what they were doing. And um, I mean, even in a silly sense, and I'm just, I guess it's because I'm in a silly mood today, <laughs> I, I think of Mary Poppins and um, this uh, where the mother in Mary Poppins is um, is a suffragette, but she's just just it's the total um, the total uh, caricature of the subservient wife when her husband is present and she's bringing him his pipe and his slippers and his dressing his smoking gown. And she's saying, oh, yes, yes, dear. Oh, yes, dear. That's so clever, dear. And in the meantime, she's doing her own thing completely. And, um, and he has, he's like a buffoon. He has no knowledge of all these things that are going on because he's just accepting the pipe and the slippers and the smoking gown. And it's, it's done so beautifully because it's a total, um, you know, it's fun, but you, you, see, you see exactly who's, you know, I mean, we say who's wearing the pants in the family. You know, which are in itself, just that term, is who, who's playing that masculine role, the, the, the role of, of power. Okay, thank you. I would like to, to say something about shadows, uh, what you were asking, Beatrice. Um, when in this integral, uh, thing we talk about shadows there is a trauma somewhere <laughs> in your upbringing and um, and when it's big enough then it keeps you from developing in this area where it occurred and so you you stay kind of in this age on a certain level could be in interpersonal in intrapersonal um, religious, whatever, uh, and and to to uncover that shadow and and have that open and transformed helps you develop in this in this area. And the dark shadow is is so the trauma and the the light the the golden shadow is something like you adore somebody and not seeing that you have it yourself. So it's also impeding your development if you always externalize all the goodies so that's that's one <laughs> i just wanted to say and, and and christine thank you for your question because i think it's very very multi-layered there's no i think there's no quick answer to it there is this oppression and women have dealt over the centuries to, to, yeah, to kind of cope and survive with it and have created mechanisms and maybe shadows, <laughs> collective shadows that let them behave a certain way and suppress other women. And yeah, so I, I think this is really like <laughs> piled on and um, and I was interested in women who have powerful rich men, husbands, and how they behave in this, or in the political frame. Um, I think we, we have that in our brains that women are the better people <laughs> somehow. And, and then you find some, uh, especially in the political uh, area, where they behave in a way or, um, or slavery. It was not the men who were the most vicious. 
with slaves. So it's, yeah, so I'm kind of left in the open to, <laughs> to think. I thought about it very often, but I have no conclusion yet. I want to reply to Victoria because I feel so the same as you. The authenticity, it's uh, the main thing for me. And, uh, and also, you know, for me, going on stage and putting nice dresses on, it, I always thought that is a role I'm taking on. And then at, in private, I don't need makeup and I don't need all this stuff because I don't want to play the role in my private life. And I, I've, I've outsourced it on, for the stage, let's say, this uh, feminine appearance. And yeah, just to, to reconfirm what you said, Victoria. Um, I, d I don't know if this fits in. I don't want to take us off on a different tangent, but um, again, Victoria's comment about authenticity is important. But I feel like, you know, that's one of the benefits of getting older. And Beatrice, I hope, I hope you discover this as, as you get older, that the, there's more freedom to be authentic um, in the second half of your life, I think. Uh, and women were, again, that we were told for millennia what our positive or negative characteristics were. And that included our capabilities. Um, what we were capable of. So women weren't supposed to vote because we were too irrational, too emotional. Politics is too dirty for women. It would make us, it would just dirty women and, and they had to be pristine and kept very nice. And it seems to me that um, unlike men, women are supposed to be pleasing to other people. That a lot of what these role-playing things are that we end up with is that is in order to seem pleasing to others. And I don't think men are strapped by that quite as much. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was, I think technology has been a friend to women, um, very much so, because before, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, it was so important that physical attributes went into work. Um, men had such an advantage because physically they were stronger. Um, but now with technology, you know, really try to think of something that a man does that a woman can't do. Um, so all those characteristics that they said we didn't have or couldn't do, um, really have fallen by the wayside because that hasn't proved to be the point with technology and, and advances in modern life. Women can pretty much bear children and do other things. We're not, uh, not conscripted to uh, one role. So I don't know, that was a lot of points. So I apologize for, for all my different directions with that. I just would like to add to uh, Gertrude's explanation of the integral shadow, that one of the clues that there is a shadow is that you are triggered by something. It, it, and this is quite an easy way to find out there is a shadow. If somebody says something and you think, uh, then you are triggered. And this is a good way to, and it's the integral way of approaching the shadow. And I found that very, very useful all the time, since I know it. Monia, and how is it collectively? How, how would the society uh, recognize that uh, they are in shadow? Well, I've been thinking most of the time now that you've been talking about our TV presenter. We have a man and a woman, always in the news. And 
And uh, the woman just, uh, first of all, she doesn't wear glasses. So sometimes she can't read the text properly. And uh, she wore glasses just a couple of days ago and maybe now she has contact lenses, I don't know. But it's the way she, when she passes on the monologue to her partner, she says always his name like, ah, Tarek. And my husband and I, we just broke up every time. It's so ridiculous. And we have also a woman doing the weather and you know exactly how many steps she takes so he shows her behind. That's outdated. It's no longer, in Germany, they have men presenting the weather and that's, they are just down to earth. So in Austria, we still have this uh, female male role exchange, but role playing it probably is. I'm, I think they are very much aware of it, what they are doing there. But obviously the audience enjoys it. I don't know, but this is the collective audience. And my husband, I would just laugh about it. That's, yeah. So um, what triggers the collective in women? Hmm. Well, we have now... Uh, How, can How can you recognize the trigger? Yeah, yeah. I mean. we have many uh, female politicians now. And uh, the way they present their issues is just not the way a man would present it. Just to the point, without emotions, they always have to put all their emotions in. Maybe this is still a shadow, I don't know. But it's noticeable that women are much more offended when they are opposed. Uh, I don't know, our chancellor, he's very young and he always keeps a very smooth face and just easy speaking. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of role playing. It's, it's still a lot of role playing. The question to me, we were talking about the feminine uh, qualities and what are the values? Is it a value that the news um, people are talking only, you know, like we were talking about the performance. They can have the um, partner death two hours ago and then they go to work and they, they are like no emotions at all. Is this the value we want or what, what do we want collectively? Do, don't we push something always in the shadow? I was just, oh, sorry. I was just thinking that one part of shadow is also that you keep doing it, though it's not uh, useful anymore. So it's, it's like, it's re an ongoing thing and pattern. Um, and, and sometimes it doesn't fit into what is useful now or what, so, um, so even those role plays could be kind of a reoccurring thing and they are not even aware in, a, in, in the, uh, really fully being aware what they are doing. It's more like, okay, you have to behave that way. Or, so it's a trained thing that you trained yourself somewhere and, and forgot about it, that this is not natural <laughs> or not really like belonging to, to you in a, in a unique, in a fundamental sense. So well, I think that's part of yeah. shadow to, to have that pattern still going on mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if it's outdated. So I'm just wondering if our TV presenters would do it the opposite way. The man is always standing there and yeah, and she's somehow more emotional. If they would do it the other way around, my goodness, can you imagine that? That the man got, <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> So we are, which what I want to say is we are very much stereotyped in our, in what we see and what we perceive, uh, but which isn't the reality probably. I, I don't really follow politics, um, but I do feel like in American politics, it might be a little bit of the opposite and, it, and it's also a shadowy thing, but that 
the men are allowed to get angry and they are allowed to be really dramatic about their opinions about things. Um, and that's actually valued. And if, if a woman politician shows any, especially if it's, if it's an anger or outrage against the system or, or something that's considered a negative emotion, um, she's immediately cut down and not, her point is not seen as valid because she's irrational and emotional and aggressive. And hysterical. She's just a woman hysterical. Are hysterical, aren't they? <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting, yeah, that, that emotional dynamic thing is interesting. But, um, but uh, what um, Dare Child was saying um, about uh, it being trained in, I feel like that's true of a lot of uh, negative and trauma and mental illness issues that you get so comfortable, even if you're aware of it, you're so comfortable in the cycle that even if you know that breaking out of it would be a positive thing, you don't want to be uncomfortable or go into the change or do something new, right? And so you stay in the negative cycle because at least you know how to be in that cycle, right? So I think that's that's a hard hard thing to break out of. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the natural tendency to be nurturing and kind of mothering. And at least for me personally, I know not all women feel that naturally but i i've always felt that and i i hope and know one day i will be a mother i've always known that i've never been one of those people that didn't want to have children or didn't know how i felt about it but i think i i tend to be mothering and nurturing in all situations and then i get really frustrated because the people around me are then i feel like they're not pulling their weight because i'm taking care of them but I get stuck in a cycle because I, I end up not trusting that they know how to take care of themselves or that they can take care of the thing. And so even if I try to delegate or try to ask them to do something, I'm still kind of secretly lurking <laughs> and knowing that they're going to forget or mess up and I'm going to have to come in and, and solve the problem. And I, it's par partially the mothering thing and partially, you know, I've done so many uh, administrative jobs where I've been an event, event planner or producer or something where I am really good at organizing everything and, and, and getting all of the things lined up perfectly and well. It's really hard for me to let go of that and trust that someone else is going to be able to do that. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, I've been thinking about that, especially in relation to gender dynamics um, with the various men in my life that <laughs> I, yeah, I just don't. I don't trust that they'll take care of themselves or that they'll get the thing done. And even if I try to remind them, I'm still keeping a to-do list on my own own side to make sure that if inevitably they forget, <laughs> I'll, I'll you know, bug them about it again. I don't know. And I, I don't like that. And I don't want to be, it feels controlling and, it feel, and it's exhausting. I want to be able to take things off my to-do list and not worry about it. Yeah, you'll still have many years to learn that and to let go. <laughs> yeah, what I wanted to say, that's so typical woman. No? We want to, to control the man. And that may be a shadow too, no? And not only a personal shadow, but collectively we women want our men to, to control our men. And then there is a saying, women want, our, want their men to be different and men want their women never to change. <laughs> so. I heard that in Japan, I, I'm not sure. So I just heard some, some time ago that um, most women file for divorce and this is when the husbands get retired. <laughs> so when they come together in a close setting, but this is not, so I'm, I'm not sure about that, but just. Well, the Corona crisis uh, maybe also helps now that people who have to be together much closer than before 
uh, yeah, I've heard some similar results. Uh, yeah, the shadows pop up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and this is relating to what uh, Christine said um, or asked earlier. Um, Kim Bato, he, he, he said that the shadow is something that it's an intriact, that you take it from the outside in and say, okay, um, so you, you take the beliefs of what others impose on you as if it was yours. And the other one is a projection, like the president of a certain country. Uh, says, I'm not a racist, you are a racist. So, and, and to deal with it, it's kind of, um, so you cannot one size fits all. So if it's an intrigue, you, you have to get let go, you have to get it out. And if it's a projection, you have to take it back. And that this is a, a difference. And I think that relates to your question, uh, Christine. Is it interjected or projected from us mm -hmm. so and to what extent what so that's i'm realizing that it's obviously quite difficult to to talk about a collective shadow because we always go back to the personal shadow to, to what single people do and i'm wondering if if there is something which we could call a collective shadow? Or is it just, you know, ours and a sum of the single shadow topics? What would you say, Christine, for instance? Um, no, I think there's collective shadow that, you know, that at least the majority of women would say they experience something similar because I, I don't think when you think of worldwide, I think a lot of, there's a lot of similarities uh, in how cultures treat men and women. I mean, there's been a few matriarchal cultures in the history of the world, but not too many. Um, so those would be interesting to know about, but I think, yeah, I think there's a collective shadow um, that exists for women. We have a common experience uh, regardless of where, what type of society we live in or, or where in the world we live, at least if you're living in a modern, you know, fairly modern world. Yeah, and then there comes to your first question, uh, how come? Did we contribute? Did, was it imposed by men or, or by women or both and so on? And Ken Wilber says women would be sheep if uh, if it was only the men who have uh, um, have started and maintained patriarchy, so we we obviously had some advantages and enough advantages to not oppose right away to this sort of living together. And I think we we need to to explore that a little bit more. You know, what is our part in? And I would also call that shadow, that we don't ask for our contribution also in personal life to what is happening, but that we are easy in externalizing, say, oh, that's patriarchy, you know, and, the, and both, both the man and the culture is uh, guilty for what I am now, you know, or what women are now. Up, I think up to a certain point is right, but we are maintaining it, or we are helping to maintain it, and I believe that we are were also helping to to install it. How do you say to 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 start the whole thing? How cultures develop, and then what we see, what we are talking and complaining about, for me, is the <laughs> the, the the unhealthy part of relationships and patriarchy relationships, personal and also in in society. But there could maybe a healthy part, you know, a healthy mode mode uh, possibility of living together without women needing all to be, become politics, uh, politicians and uh, uh, without equalizing everything, you know, without 50% everywhere. So just throw it in to, to explore. Uh, 
and as integrally informed women, we also know about evolution and the, the various spiral dynamic stages. So uh, it's a different, it's a different uh, civilization in red, and women face different shadows in red, and it's probably also in the higher uh, stages as well. So maybe we should just think about that. We have lots of theory like in Wilma, and we can really apply it. Well, find I the proper language. Yeah, Christine. I think it's partly human nature that we all try to find some control. Um, Heidi, you talked about control and some uh, control really, I think, is the desire to influence your own life, you know, to be the agent and actor and decision maker in your own life. That's what control is. And so women, you know, in the Japanese culture uh, that was mentioned, where they could assert power was in the home and they gobbled it all up. <laughs> they just took it for themselves so that they could have that influence and agency over their domain, their life. But obviously other places were walled off to them where they couldn't have any influence. Um, and I think now the question is for the modern woman, you know, how long does it take to break through some of those barriers? Um, because equal pay, uh, a lot of things still are not equitable uh, in society and it still takes a long time to, to change that. So I don't know who's holding us back, <laughs> but it's not uh, necessarily coming uh, easily. There is the term, the glass ceiling. So actually you don't really see it, mm -hmm. but you just uh, push against it. And I think it's a good, a good uh, mm. metaphor. And I think there is, um, it's like sociology and psycholo uh, psychology, um, like coming together. It's, it's not the women's shadow. I mean, as if it was something outside of personal of women. It's not, it's just the collection or like education, what do you do in education? How do you educate your children? This is kind of a collective, but it's made up by personal experiences and by personal um, traumas, personal decisions. And, and, and so I think it, there is no, it's either or, or it's not, um, what is, it's distinct, but not um, a part. So the collective shadow is made up in many personal shadows. It's not a thing <laughs> per se. Uh, I was just thinking about, I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, exercise. It's called pushing hands and in, uh, you do it together with a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. And the one who just gives way leads. So if the energy is put, the young energy, well, I want to push you, and the yin energy just gives way, then the young energy just has to follow. It's quite fascinating. Uh, try to find it. It's called pushing hands. And uh, it taught me a lot about how to manipulate men. So if you are really soft and you're just, they have to follow. So it's, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very useful exercise to see how energies work. I just want to add two things. One, um, we're talking about children too, that I think another big part of this is how, how are boys raised and what kinds of things are they taught to do as children and what are they taught to value as children? I think it also, like, yes, it matters how we raise our, our daughters and the women, but also the future men, the future generations of men, because it's just gonna keep perpetuating 
um, and what values they have and what kinds of things that they're told that they can or can't do or what kinds of emotions they can or cannot express. So I think that's one thing. And the second thing I want to say, um, Monia, you mentioned the glass ceiling and someone said to me uh, in another, it was actually in the context of talking about racism in the United States, but we were talking about the glass ceiling idea and someone said that, um, remember that when you, sh when you shatter a glass ceiling, that's painful. Like shat if you think about the metaphor of shattering glass, that there's actually shards of glass coming down that could injure you. And so just being aware that, that this progress or just acknowledging that the progress of shattering the glass ceiling is also going to come with pain and, and is not an easy process. Right. You, know, you can't see it, but when you do see it, you, you do shatter it. Yeah, that's a dramatic, it's a dramatic action. And it, and it, it will take a lot out of I'm just looking at the clock and um, I was wondering if we could, just as a suggestion, if we could see what positive things came out of our shadows. What qualities did we acquire out of it, of these yeah, role playing or traumas, whatever that might be, to, to see what strength we have uh and yeah so and what could be a good growth step out of this something like that that's coming up should yeah. we do that as a, a checkout checkout question for yeah so what's your takeaway for today and maybe you can have an appreciative word about yourself or somebody else here and yeah, and maybe the subject for next time. Um, I am very appreciative of all of you, your collective wisdom. <laughs> and I'm really, um, I'm really appreciative of uh, what you said, Heidi, that now has me, um, now I do feel more delight, just like I was hoping. <laughs> Because I realized when you said the golden shadow and you were talking that that's exactly, um, that's exactly the front on which I've been um, working ever since my mother passed away last year, um, trying, to, trying to learn self-compassion and um, you know, self-appreciation and all of those things that, that I, I realized when you said that, I've spent my entire life projecting everything I even did it last night with a friend of mine um, that is very put together. She's the one that I invited to come today. And, um, and I said to Beatrice, you know, I wish I could be like her because she's so organized and put together and so strong and all of this. And, and she always gets things done. And Beatrice said, well, we just did a, you know, a 90 minute <laughs> vigil that worked out beautifully. You know, she had to, Beatrice had to remind me. I thought we, I had done nothing in my, I mean, I just felt like a worm. So thank you for the golden shadow, and I, um, I hope it'll still be there when we get off this call. <laughs> and just to share, I think a positive thing of all of this is adaptability. I think that the fact that women are able to do this role playing and to kind of shift gears depending on the context makes them, makes us extremely adaptable to any situation. Um, I think that's powerful and I think if we choose to adapt, maybe we, if we're more conscious about how we're adapting in different situations, maybe that's a way to turn the tide. Um, but I think that's a great, the flexibility and adaptability is a great, great power and a beautiful thing. And also nurturing. I think, I mean, the, the, mother, the mother statement about the mothering and the nurturing is also, I think that's one of the most beautiful things. Um, sometimes it's frustrating and, and can feel like it's over applied, <laughs> but it's a very, that's a very beautiful quality as well. Thank you for letting me join in today. All well, right, my checkout passed. <laughs> uh, I'm appreciative of this setting, how it enables us to co create and to empower each other. As you said, nurturing, Beatrice. Uh, 
yeah, I'm very appreciative of that and I'm very grateful to Heidi for enabling it and to all of you for just sharing authentically, which makes it a great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, Gertrude's leading, so, as she always does, just. <laughs> I am appreciative of all everybody showing up, but uh, thank you in particular, Beatrice, for taking an hour of your vacation <laughs> or your your visit. Uh, uh, the two of you taking an hour to share with us that was really nice. And um, thank you for the organization, uh, Heidi and Gertrude. Um, I'm going to think this week more about the golden shadow because I do think that's um, something uh, I haven't considered much and probably would be very helpful looking at ways in which I'm capable that I don't give myself credit for or things that um, I think reside only in other people uh, that I need to own for myself. So that's gonna be helpful. Yeah, and I appreciate very much the presence of Beatrice, a, a younger generation, because we are always among each other, the old guys, <laughs> the old gales. <laughs> and I, I would really like to, to be able to hear more of the perspectives of the young generation. You are, I mean, Christine, you have a daughters and also Gertrude and, and Monia. I don't have uh, children, so... and. I don't know. I don't know many young people around. So I'm really happy to hear something. And then I'm always astonished how, how, how can I say that? Let's say it differently. I don't think when I was about 30 that maybe that's shadow topic. I don't know, but that I was so, so clear in my mind and that I could articulate myself in this way. I don't think so really. I was much more driven. Uh, it was the time when I was still in, in Germany and I didn't know what to do. And then later I went, came to Italy, but it was always more a sort of push of my soul. But I don't think I was so clear uh, in, in, in considering my life and uh, under these aspects as you are already able to do that. And that's absolutely great. I'm, I'm appreciating that. For, for, for you and for the young generation that obviously that's possible. Very good. Yeah, and uh, Gertrude, I think we could continue in some way with what you have proposed before next time and uh, would be great to continue in some way uh, on these topics. You know. As Christine said, maybe we just talk about golden shadows we have Back. Yep. Yep. That, that could be. come together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And I appreciate very much Beatrice for being here. And I, I, I just feel like inviting you to, to another call tomorrow morning, 8.30 here, but you're still asleep then. Um, and uh, for me, the, 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 uh, there was one question that you asked Christine that was for me opening up this, is it imposed or is it projected? And, and I think that's, that was a really important question that opened up a, a whole new conversation. And thank you, especially you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all everyone else for your contribution. So, take over again. And Complete. I, yeah, I can do that. I, I was just <laughs> astonished because I came in here. What, what did we want to talk about? I was kind of a little bit not organized. Yeah, two weeks, it's a long time to remember. I'm, I'm in a better position because I always listen to what we are doing and write the timestamps. So I'm more, uh, you know, up to date mm -hmm. of what we were doing. Not always, but most of the yeah. time. So, yeah, thank you. And with that, I stop the recording and thank you. <laughs>